We will now hear from the five teams that comprise our cohort focused on understanding and overcoming the limitations uh, associated with neuronal maturation in vitro. Uh, this is a challenge that has hindered our ability to, to delve deeply into the full complexity of human neuronal function in both health and disease. This is a cohort that began about two and a half years ago, so it'll be really exciting to see the advances that have been made. And uh, we'll start off with um, Dr. Jeffrey Maklis. Uh, Dr. Maklis is a Max and Ann Wien Professor of Life Sciences in the Department of Stem Cell and Regenerative Biology and Center for Brain Science at Harvard University. Thanks very much, Kathy. Um, so what I'd like to share with everybody today uh, is the, uh, the early parts of work and the first elements that I'm going to tell you about today will be coming out in the next couple of months. But I think they cross some boundaries and I really like these meetings and meeting my colleagues and being part of this. We've already uh, heard about um, subnuclear specialization and I'm going to expand on that kind of theme of spatial localization of cellular control and tell you and share with you some work that developing neurons, and in particular, I'm going to tell you about cerebral cortex projection neurons, and if somebody could put off the front spots, that would be great if that would help, um, have subcellularly distinct transcriptomes and proteomes in multiple parts of the same neuron. And we know that this is true for at least two distinct transcriptomes and proteomes in their growth cones and cell bodies. And my speculation, and I think we'll have data soon, is that a neuron can have several distinct transcriptomes and proteomes in multiple growth cones of distinct axons that they're sending to distinct targets. And I think this has relevance whether we're talking about an incredibly polarized uh, neuron or a less polarized epithelial cell that has apical and basal uh, um, uh, areas of different function. And I'm going to tell you how we got to those uh, uh, discoveries by developing a quantitative approach to subcellular RNA proteome mapping of every protein and RNA species, or at least detectable, of subtype and stage specific uh, growth cones compared to their own parent somata and find that there's molecular machinery in the growth cones that indicates that they're maybe quite a bit more autonomous than we thought. Now I'm going to be thinking about human cerebral cortex and function and we've sort of already heard about some of this and the driving principles from Alan this morning, but I'm going to tell you about work all in mice and the work I'm going to tell you about was spearheaded by uh, a recently uh, finished postdoc, Alex Palopoulos, who's at University of Maryland, and a program in neuroscience graduate student who's completed Alex Murphy. And we see some growth cones in vitro from, whoops, uh, from uh, beautiful foundational work of Christine Holt and others uh, growing in culture. And this is such a growth cone, I'll tell you more about these in culture, but this isn't actually what they look like in vivo. And there's been no knowledge prior to the work I'm going to tell you about, about how such growth cones of neurons build this complex circuitry. This is, in a sense, a different version of what Alan showed us about all of the complexity of uh, formation of, of circuits. In addition, growth cones are what underlies the lack of regeneration in the adult mammalian CNS. And this work is the fourth of the sub-projects of our more complicated title that you see in the in, in the grouping. So first I'm going to tell you about growth cone molecular machinery that implements subtype specific brain wiring and specifically tell you that we think we've identified ways or we know we've identified ways of getting at subtype specific and stage specific growth cone control over not only development but immense diversity of neurons and potentially we think why synapses fall apart in disease and why they don't regrow in regeneration through this autonomous machinery by this uh, quantitative mapping approaches. Just to remind some of you who are not uh, card-carrying neurobiologists, about 130 years ago, Santiago Ramon y Cajal from Roadkill and, and, uh, and Static Images defined how neurons grow over time and defined and gave the name growth cone to this motile protoplasmic uh, portion that he talked about and pointed out something that many of us forget that 
these turn into synapses. So everything I'm going to tell you about here, I think, has a uh, function in the adult brain, and we're going to be trying to discover that. What Cajal left out here by all of the dot, dot, dots is that these growth cones grow over 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 cell body diameters away from cell body. And to put it in perspective, if my body were the soma, my arm would be the size of axon, and it would grow 20 to 30 to 70 kilometers with precision and find a target about as big as this room maybe 10 cell body diameters in size. We know a lot from work from Paula Tourneau, Christine Holt, John Flanagan, mu multiple others about local uh, control um, uh, with either bound or diffusible attractants or repellent factors and general ideas in sort of um, uh, homogenized growth cones in culture about uh, control over cytoskeleton, and uh, a calcium signaling that leads to collapse and rerouting of growth cones. What we don't know anything about in the field so far is subtype specific control to build all that circuitry. So Alex and Alex took on the question thinking that molecularly diverse growth cones might exert uh, control over not only development through response to intermediate target signals, uh, but also the immense diversity of the brain, like Alan Jones was telling us about, and I think I relatively agree with those kinds of numbers, 100 cell types in each of 100 areas of the mammalian neocortex, or even in the mouse, is about 10,000 neuron types, I think would be sort of my guess. And they're making circuits to very, very specific places. So maturation and synapse formation, the idea I've already mentioned, regeneration versus inhibition, and the fact that this has got to be somewhat autonomous because even by fast axonal transport, to get a signal back from growth cone at a place 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 4 cell body diameters away would take 8 to 15 hours to tell nucleus what to do. And though I've uh, spent a lot of my career thinking in the nucleus and I believe in transcriptional regulation and central dogma, I'm going to tell you about some new kinds of biology that we think are much more growth cone localized uh, at protein and RNA machinery level. So neurons perform a number of very polarized functions. I'm not going to talk about progenitor polarization or migration or dendritic development, but dendrites also have growth cones. I'm going to focus on axonal growth cones that grow over many days to even weeks this very long distance, 1,000 to 100,000 cell body diameters away. And here's an electroporation experiment where we labeled some growth, some neuron uh, somata that send their axons to mirror image locations in the other hemisphere. And blown up, we can see that against a very dark background, we can look at their axons led by these motile growth cones uh, setting up circuitry over these few days and then over the next week or so digging into cortex and finding very specific targets. I won't give you the background, but we know this is very largely cell autonomous and, de and somewhat uh, highly deterministic. Um, final uh, um, um, uh, building and solidification is activity dependent, but otherwise we can take away individual transcriptional regulators and totally change, refine, or modify or swap uh, circuit connectivity. Um, so we developed an approach to isolate growth cones uh, from their somata, amenable to very high depth, nearly full depth proteomics, not all, not all triptych peptides fly, and very high depth uh, fully saturating RNA-seq that's generalizable to developmental, stage-specific, mutant kinds of growth cones that I'm not going to get into today. And the approach is to either, with Cree driver lines or electroporation, genetic molecularly label growth cones, separate them, as I showed you, biophysically by tearing them off the axons. I'll tell you what happens there, a physical growth cone uh, isolation, modified by Carl Fenninger, who was at Columbia long ago, who developed a similar approach for EM, these are false color codes I've put on, uh, 
centrifugation, and then some modifications of optics and fluidics we developed with BD to make fluorescent small particle sorting and purification of growth cones against all negative ones. And because of time, I'm only going to assert the results, uh, and this is cut off, so I'll just read it for you, that the uh, purified growth cones are singlets, not doublets or aggregates. We can uh, uh, investigate that um, uh, rigorously with multicolor growth cones from different mice, and we get single particles that are uh, intact closed particles, closed spheroids of about three to 500 nanometers in size that contain very high quality RNA and protein that's amenable uh, to very high depth uh, sequencing and proteomics. John Hatch, who contributed, uh, contributed to this project, who's a current uh, graduate student. So going back to those electroporations I showed you, by labeling with an H2B tag the neuronal uh, nuclei and taking out the same neurons growth cones simultaneously, we can quantitatively look at every RNA species and every protein species, and without any external normalization, ask where within this highly distributed polarized cell is every species and define some new analytic approaches with these lambda values for every individual R1 through Rn, et cetera. And that allows this quantitative subcellular RNA proteo mapping. And I'm not going to show you many primary data, but if I show you the proteome of just a single stage of one type of colossal projection neuron, I think many here, we might have thought this is a small cellular system. It has anabolic and catabolic protein folding degradation machinery. It has, in addition to all of the actin cytoskeleton and, and receptors, there are RNA binding proteins, full large and small subunit ribosomes, proteasomes, lysosomes, of course, energy. But although this is not ready for prime time, I'd love to discuss it with some ribosomal uh, uh, experts. We're doing some experiments now to begin uh, to look at what we think we're seeing, that each subtype of growth cone we've looked at has distinct ribosomal types that resemble what Maria Barna at Stanford is proposing as specialized ribosomes with specialized 400-ish uh, translatomes. And we're interested in the fact that these three to 500 nanometer uh, semi-independent structures, uh, growth cones, might actually be acting like their own control units with individual ribosomes. And I'll get back to this in a minute. To make a long story short, um, there are lots of transcripts out there. Uh, about 70% are coding, 30% non-coding of all the flavors we can consider. But the most striking thing is there are hundreds of transcripts and hundreds of proteins enriched in growth cones, orders of magnitude compared to their own parent somata. So that even with essentially full depth RNA-seq, you don't even see them in the cell body. And you might say, well, how can that be if we believe in central dogma? So that got us thinking that since these transcripts almost certainly have to be built way back there at the nucleus, maybe there are motifs or other RNA binding and transport or splice variant mechanisms that ship them out of the factory as soon as they're built. And it turns out that looks to be the case, although we don't have all of the super resolution imaging uh, yet. We're, uh, we can show you the molecular evidence. And the molecular evidence are that if we look, for example, in one type of growth cone and parent somata now, at those transcripts that are highly enriched by orders of magnitude, at this stage of axon elongation that I'm showing you here, something like 83 out of the 92 known on Earth mTOR hypersensitive transcripts are enriched in the growth cone along with the entire mTOR control machinery. Now, this goes against textbooks and review articles. And two weeks earlier, this same neuron has the whole mTOR machinery in the cell body while it's migrating, moving, and setting up. And two weeks later, when it's decising on size and building dendrites, it's back there. But during this time, this entire machinery, including mTOR itself, is out at growth cones in, this, in these uh, serendipitous shots. Compared to the cell body itself, these are hot spots in growth cones. The entire associative uh, uh, um, co-regulatory machinery, LARP1, 
Raptor and Richter for both mTOR1 and mTOR2 complexes are localized and enriched in growth cones. And all of these five prime top motifs mTOR hypersensitive transcripts, or almost all of them, are enriched amazingly highly in the growth cones at this time. And you know, this is a quandary because as, as most or all of you know, these are largely uh, ribosomal structural proteins. So why would a cell that is polarized over 10 or 100,000 cell body diameters um, want to have its transcripts to make ribosomal structural proteins out there. And we have some speculations we can talk about I won't get into, but we think that maybe this is a passing over of growth control to growth cones. And I'll close in the next few slides. Um, and we can take this away functionally and rather than PI3 kinase dominant negatives that just mess up how neurons grow and migrate, if we take away mTOR at the right time, we just delete this entire interhemispheric uh, connectivity. So to start wrapping up to the next slide, adding motivation, many of us know, and maybe even David Reich's uh, talk uh, uh, just before the break hints at this, that many of the uh, vulnerability genes for intellectual disability, neurodevelopmental, neuropsychiatric disorders are named in the annotation uh, systems as synaptic genes. But many of us know there are often circuit abnormalities. And we wonder whether what are annotated as just synapse genes are really circuit development, whether we bolt or Velcro or build what kind of synapse. And we're interested in getting at that. And also, why regeneration doesn't happen in the, in the adult mammalian brain. So in closing, I've tried telling you just a little bit of data, and there's much more um, we've been discovering that after early programming, admittedly by subtype-specific nuclei, growth cones appear to be subtype-specific, seemingly quite autonomous control systems over development, diversity, uh, and maybe unique cell biologies. And that makes sense by a neuron having to be in hundreds of microenvironments simultaneously and has to decide which IGF or which WINT do I listen to because I can't listen everywhere. And their molecular networks are not even observed as somal transcripts and proteins that I think should make us think about single cell approaches, especially those that might be 10 or 15 or 20 percent depth, whether we might be missing many of the things that actually underlie circuit building, circuit maintenance, circuit function. And because these become synaptic specializations, we think that really uh, makes growth cones be thinking, uh, be, be uh, appearing as developmental synapses. And to throw one more uh, 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 little factoid out there, many of you know that there are neurons that can send two or three or, th or more distinct axons simultaneously. How does that happen controlled by one nuclear transcriptional regulatory machinery? So prior members of the lab, I told you about Alex and Alex. Kadir Ozkan and John Hatch that contributed to this. And this was all launched by the Allen Frontiers group. So thanks very much, and sorry to go over. <laughs>